So yeah, I, I'm so happy to be here uh, in, 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 in Missouri State, beautiful Missouri State, and uh, Sophie and I, my, my wife Sophia is here with me. Would you say hi, Sophie? And I'm so happy, so, yes, yes, and we're so happy to be here uh, together. We, uh, we have three boys, a seven-year-old, five-year-old, two-year-old, and life, uh, it's, it's intense and beautiful back home, back home, so our boys say hi, and our church is gathering as we speak, so they are praying for you, and we are so happy to be a family together. We, we as a church, we are a nation, a nation among the nations, and, and it's so great to, to connect and to feel at home, even uh, away from home. It's this feeling of togetherness. Uh, we are so grateful for you. And uh, oh, you don't know this, but you guys have been part of our love story, Sophie and I, um, since the beginning. Uh, back in the day, you want a story before yeah. preach? Okay. Yeah. So back in the day, when I was trying to convince uh, Sophie to be my girlfriend, as uh, she's out of my league, absolutely, but I, I was trying to convince her to, to be my girlfriend. So I, um, we were a few dates. We, we were out on a few dates, and John and Linda Lanferman, uh were visiting our home church uh, in Guadalajara back in the day. So Sophie and I um, were there during their visit, and, and Sophie came to Linda asking for prayer and then for advice about this handsome Mexican guy that she was dating. Okay, you can laugh if you want. Uh, so, so I don't know the details of how this conversation went that day, but uh, you can ask Sophie the details later if you're curious about it. But that day I confirmed that Linda is a woman led by, led by the Holy Spirit because a long story short, she encouraged Sophie to move forward in a relationship. So I basic, basically owe the Lamfermans a lot. So uh, I would have never dreamed that 14 years later, Sophie and I would be here visiting this beautiful church. So this is the way God does things. And yes, I lead an eldership team in Guadalajara, Mexico, Origen Church. We are five because we believe the, the five guys burgers doctrine. So we are five elders. Uh, I love that place, by the way. And just so, so happy to be here and grateful for, the, for being around the church family of God. So let's just pray. Uh, we, let's pray and get into our text. Um, can you join me and pray for me and I'll pray for you? Lord, we come to your word again and not just to be inspired, but to be transformed. We open up our lives to you and we believe your word's like a fire. So please, please uh, set our lives on fire for you today. And as we submit to the authority of your word, please give us eyes to see and ears to hear the beauty of your majesty display in these verses that we're about to read. Thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit today, transforming our hearts and our lives. We want to know you more, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So let's read Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3. It says, The Lord had said to Abram, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. And all the families on earth will be blessed through you. So here we see uh, this moment uh, where God calls Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees uh, at 75 years old and makes him an extraordinary promise. So God promises to bless Abram and to make him a great blessing to others. He promises that all the families on earth will be blessed through him. And Abraham is invited to, to walk with God into a new future, a new reality. He's been invited to be a fundamental part of, of God's redemption story for humanity. Uh, but he doesn't know this yet. Uh, now... To understand the significance of this moment, to understand the significance of this encounter with God, this promise made to Abram, we need to go back just a bit more to see the big picture of how things were at that moment of the story. So there's a, in Genesis, the, in the early chapters of Genesis, there's this, this progression of violence escalating in, in, in the Bible. We see a, a man named Cain uh, 
killing his brother Abel. And, and then it escalates into greater and greater sin and, and, and destruction. And, and we need to remember that Abraham lived in a tribal society. So every family fought, fought with each other to assure their survival. Uh, and, and only the strongest uh, was the last one standing. So Abraham is told in chapter 12, all families on earth will be blessed through you. So this was a whole new idea. This, uh, this, this was unheard of before. Uh, God choosing a man to write, ra raise a family that won't conquer and kill each other, but they will bless other people. They will not be about conquering and about uh, 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 fighting against other people, but blessing other people. And how do you form this new kind of humanity? How do you form this new kind uh, of people moving into a different direction? Well, God invites a family into a journey. God invites Abraham and Sarah into a journey. And they, uh, he promises to make them a great nation. He, he promises to give them an, an offspring. Uh, uh, you will have kids. That's a promise God gives him. You will have a son. And, and Abraham, Abraham has a destiny to fulfill uh, in which he's promised uh, to become the father of a new nation. God promises to a, a new kind of people to usher a new era in humanity. It's so exciting. And a, a new era not based in, in, in violence, but in love. And Abraham and his wife, Sarah, believe God's promise and start the journey to Canaan. They start the journey to the promised land. And this is so exciting. 75 years old. Uh, they, are, they are ready to believe God for his promise. And they start walking towards the, the journey to the new future, to this new invitation that God's making to them. And, and they are so excited and they're ready to go. But when we get to chapter 15, suddenly we see that at least... 10 years have gone by from Genesis 12. So Genesis 12 to Genesis 15, suddenly we see 10 years have gone by. So they are here at 85 years old, 10 years and no offspring yet, no children yet. So here we are with Abraham and Sarah still waiting. Let's read Genesis 15, 1 to 3. This is how one day God has a new encounter with Abraham. It says, Sometime later, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you and your reward will be great. But Abram replied, O oh, sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be my heir. So God shows up to greet Abraham in a vision. He comes to his friend Abraham. He says, hey, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. And he starts telling Abraham, do not be afraid. And that's a promise. That's a commandment we hear 70 times in the Bible. And it is because fear grows. When doubt comes, he starts doubting and God welcomes Abraham. He greets Abraham saying, do not be afraid. And it's interesting because when we start doubting God, we start allowing fear and we start allowing disappointment. We start allowing frustrations to avoid us to see God moving in our lives. We see this in the Bible, in the New Testament, there are moments Where, where, when even the disciples, the people that were closer to God, had these moments where they do not recognize Jesus. It was after, after Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus resurrects from the dead, and he walks in the journey to Emmaus with these disciples. But they are so disappointed. They had this expectation of how, how the Savior, the Messiah would look like. That They are walking with Jesus himself, but they are not able to see Jesus. Because they are so disappointed. They had these expectations, but the things in life didn't happen as they expected. In Matthew 14, we see Jesus walking on the water towards his disciples. But they don't see Jesus. They see a ghost. 
And that makes me think that we can be in a journey with God, we can be Christians for a long time and still miss Jesus when he's moving in our lives in a different way than the one that we were expecting. It can happen. And when we feel this way, we allow worry and roots of bitterness to grow in us. As Tim Keller says, I like this quote, it says, worry is not believing God will get it right. And bitterness is believing God got it wrong. Have you ever felt this way? Have you ever felt the, this need of being in control of your life? Because deep down, sometimes we just don't trust God's process. We doubt. And sometimes when things happen in a different way that, than what we expected, we start feeling, feeling this bitterness inside of us. And, and, and the, the, there's Abraham here in this moment of waiting. And, and I remember, this, this is such a significant word in our life. Uh, I remember when we started church planting and we felt called by God to, to plant this new uh, church family in Guadalajara, Mexico, where people could encounter God and experience the, the presence of God. And we were so excited to start this journey with God. We believed God called us. But suddenly on the journey, things got complicated. Our dear friend Cesar, he got kidnapped. He was, he's our worship leader. He, he was uh, get us a hostage for 10 days. That wasn't in our plans. And we were like praying with his family in tears every night, believing God will come through. But it was in the midst of our certainty, in the midst of things happening, not in the way that you thought. In this first year of church planting, my mom got brain cancer and she, she was fighting a battle, a really painful battle of seeing her, uh, losing her uh, mobility and different other things. And, and we were in this journey of seeing our, our, our friend being kidnapped, then this, this, this season of, of health challenges. And then on our first year anniversary, the exact same day that we were, we were uh, celebrating a year, it was a Tuesday, I remember. And I got a call that the whole building in our church just fell down. An accident happened, the building collapsed, and we were in the midst of not knowing what to do. And it's in those moments when the things that you see and the things that you, that you hear does not make sense and do not align to the, the promise that you've heard before. When you're about to start the journey with God, you hear and you see with God a new future that's not about there. It's not here yet, but he's inviting you into a journey of faith. But when things happen in the journey, sometimes we start questioning. We start doubting. Visualize for a moment the last 10 years of your life. All the things that you expected to happen, but they haven't. Can you think of something that might complete this sentence? At this point of my life, I imagined. Please fill the blank. That I would have a better job. That I, could, that I would have been married. Only you know deep down what phrase completes this sentence for you. Uh, at this point of the story, Abraham and Sarah begin to doubt that God has promised something to them. They, they knew the promise well. They had held onto these words spoken by God for over a decade, but now they weren't so sure. Have you ever felt this way? God, it's been too long. You know, Sarah and I are not getting any younger. One of my sermons will end up being my heir. And keep in mind that he has just listened to God speaking some of the most beautiful words in the Old Testament. God came, comes to Abraham in verse 15 saying, Hey, Abraham, I am your shield. I am your greatest reward. I am your gift, Abraham. So he gets all these beautiful words from the Lord, but Abraham is answering to the Lord something like this. Ah. Oh, with all due respect, Lord. <laughs> but what good is it to me that you are my shield? What good is it to me that you are my greatest reward if I still do not have a baby? 
What good is it to me? Thank you, Lord, very much. Thank you so much. Look, but come, come see things in my perspective. Come see life through my glasses. Come see my watch. According to my watch, you are late. Come to my tent because it's obvious he's inside of some kind of tent because God's about to take him out to see a different reality. So he's in the tent and the Lord is listening to him. He's complaining. Thank you for all these blessings, but still no baby. No baby. Ten years have gone by and no baby. And look, something beautiful about God in this story is that he leans to listen to Abraham's complain. He, he comes into Abraham's tent. And let me tell you what I think. Many times we feel frustrated with the Lord, but we don't have the courage or the honesty to say it. It's easier to take our frustration on somebody else, isn't it? In our marriage, in our friendships, in our church family, in our leaders, It's easier to find someone to blame than being fully honest and say it. I'm angry with you, Lord. There's pain inside of me, Lord. There's disappointment. There's fear. There's frustration. There's things that I had expectations for. And we hide it because we think God will reject us. But we see God encountering a friend, encountering a man, and sitting with him in his pain. And that's the beauty of, the, the, of our God, that he, he is love. He is patient. He is kind. He wants to sit with us in the place of our pain, in the place of our fear, in the place where life is uncertain. And we're walking in the unknown, but he is waiting For us to bring our tears into his presence. He's waiting for us in the place of our pain. I love Isaiah 118 when the first part of this verse says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Let's discuss the issue that has been holding you back for years. Let's talk about the frustration in which you've been living all this crazy season of your life that hasn't been as you expected. And today we can choose if we remain discouraged or we go to his presence. We become more honest than polite. More real than with a protocol. And we just come to a place of vulnerability Because God is not, not waiting for us in the fulfillment of the promises, but the beauty of the gift we have as sons and daughters is that we walk with the Lord in the journey. He is our gift. He is our greatest reward. And that's the beauty of, of, of being a son, being a daughter. Can, we can choose to have an attitude of fear or change it for an attitude of faith. And then the Lord said to him in the verse 4, No, your, serv your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. And then the Lord took Abraham outside and said to him, Look up in the sky. Get out of this tent. You have put a ceiling over you. you. You put me in a box, but come on. Come out of this place and see my reality. I'm moving in your life. Sometimes you, are, you, you, you think I'm not moving. You think I've forgotten you, but I'm moving in the midst of, 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 of the uncertainty. Come and see the reality. I'm the God that made the stars of heaven, and this is your descendants, how we look like. This is, this is the size of the God that I am. Sometimes you don't know what I'm doing, but I'm moving. My plans are so much bigger. And I'm going to make you a great nation. I have the plans to, that through you I will bless the whole earth, the whole families in the earth. And it, it is so interesting that God doesn't give explanations to Abraham's frustration. He comes and gives him a promise. He, God never comes to Abraham saying, you know what, Abe? <sighs> Abe, you're right. It's been too long. It's, it's been too long, you are right. And excuse me for taking so long. You know, like we've been experiencing so many challenges, uh, technical difficulties in the baby department in heaven. 
Too many people having babies, but we'll, we'll get to you soon. We'll be there soon. Hold on tight. But he, he never says that. He basically says, I am God. What you need to know is that I am in control. You need to, to lay down your need to control everything and trust. I am an eternal, faithful, covenant-making God. You don't need to understand how I do things. You just need to trust how I, uh, to trust how I do things. You don't need to understand my timing. You just need to trust my timing. I am God. And I know that the good things that come to your life in the wrong time become the bad things. Sometimes we're longing for good things. But if we trust he is the God that knows our journey, we can trust his timing. We can trust he is good. And in the waiting, we can never forget that he is the God who causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him. So immediately after hearing God's promise again, something happens in Abraham. Something happens inside of him. He's about to become the father of faith. And out of this moment, we get one of the most significant verses in the Old Testament where we get actually a, a verse very quoted in the New Testament to sustain our, our doctrine of salvation through faith. In verse 6 says, Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. And listen, after such an extra extraordinary moment of faith, we would think, well, the baby is coming anytime soon right like the baby this is happening next week we're having a baby this is so exciting only that out of this moment they were 85 and God waited until they were a hundred years old to give them the son of the promise Isaac and by looking to this story I believe God is moving us to redefine what we see as impossible in our lives Jeremiah 32, verse 27 says, I am the Lord, the God, the God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? Maybe he's asking us today, is there anything too hard for me? Maybe today you are thinking, it's been 10 years. Maybe since love died in your marriage. Maybe it's been too late. My son has no remedy. He doesn't want to hear anything about God. Things are getting more and more difficult at work. Months go by. And this pain, it only gets worse. The best years of my life are over. I'm 40. I'm 60. I'm 70. And I haven't done anything with my life. But let me tell you what. God is on the move. He's working in a deeper and more significant way than we realize. Abraham chooses to believe God. And in this weird and beautiful chapter 15, God proceeds to make a covenant with Abraham. He answers his doubting. He answers his questions with a promise, with an eternal promise. He answers with an oath, promising to bless Abraham. And in this second part of Genesis 15, we are entering at the heart of what the Bible is all about. In Genesis 15, God says to Abraham, I will bless you. But Abraham says, how can I be sure? Hmm? Hmm? How can I be sure? So he starts the chapter 15 saying, I will bless you. And in chapter, in verse, in verse 8, Abraham says, okay, God, how can I be sure that you will bless me? So, so the Lord says, okay, Abraham, bring me some animals. And, and, and this, this chapter starts to get a little weird. He, he gets these animals and Abraham brings all these animals to God and he cuts the animal in two. He, he, he arranges the halves opposite to each other, forming an aisle. So he forms this aisle. And, and let me ask you a question. If you ever passed through this chapter before, have you ever wondered how come God doesn't have to tell Abraham what to do with the animals? He just tells him, get some animals. And this guy comes, God's watching, and he starts chopping the animals in half and arranging an aisle with the halves. So this is because ancient world, 
When you, when you enter into a deal with someone, you made a covenant with them and know to do your part of the deal. So first you get the animals and you cut them in half. And third, you, you'd lay out the halves with space between them, forming this aisle that I was talking about. And then you walked, every party would walk between the, this aisle saying something like this, may I become like these animals if I fail to uphold my end of the covenant. By the way, this is where we get the phrase to cut a deal. Here, a man is literally cutting a deal with God. And Abraham figured he was arranging a situation for a traditional covenant ceremony. He cuts the pieces and he's expecting to be called to walk through the aisle to promise God he will be faithful, he will fulfill uh, what he, com he, he, he promises to God, and, and God will do the same. So he waited and waited so much that the Bible says in verse 11 that some vultures swooped down to try to eat the carcasses. And uh, please, please keep this in mind, what we started talking about. So Abraham, in his world, the gods were believed to be distant, angry, arrogant, waiting for you to offer them sacrifices enough to calm their, their anger and bless you. So I will do all these things, Lord, for you to favor me, for you to comply with me. I, I, I want to I wanna please you with all these things. And, and this, is, this is sometimes the way we live. We try to do things to please God. And that's how people saw the pagan gods do whatever it takes to keep their favor. But in this story... We see a God that's spending a lot of time trying to convince a man that his plans are to bless him and to do good to him. So in the midst of this terrifying, in Genesis 15 verse 12 says that this terrifying darkness comes uh, and Abraham falls in a deep sleep. So he falls into a deep sleep, and in the midst of this terrifying darkness, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch, symbol of the presence of God, passes through this aisle. But guess what? Abram is sleeping. He can't move. He cannot walk through the aisle. The only one walking through this aisle is God. So God is committing himself to fulfill his part of the covenant and Abraham never walks through the aisle. Never. But isn't that how we cut a deal? Both pieces agree to do their part. But God commits to upholding both ends of the deal. Even when Abraham fails to do his part, God will be faithful. And let me tell you, this is encouraging news for us. But because when we fail, when we doubt, when we are in fear, he remains faithful. And what he promised, he will do. Yeah. And for our doubting, we get an eternal promise. We have a God that is fully committed to do good to his children. This is never heard of before. And in verse 18, it says, the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day God was making the promise for both of them. What God was saying was, not only will I be turned to pieces if I don't keep my promise, I'll be turned to pieces if you don't keep your promise. What God is saying to Abram and to us is, I will bless you no matter what. I will bless you. I'm moving. I haven't forgotten you. Even when you don't see it, when you don't feel it, I'm working. I'm giving you eternal promise. I'm trustworthy. I am trustworthy. And, 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 and he is committed to... to to be faithful to his promise in a way that he was uh, committing himself to fulfill this covenant, even if he literally had to be turned to pieces. And he was, wasn't he? He was. Centuries later, a terrifying darkness came upon the month of Calvary. 
And there, Jesus, the Son of God, is literally being torn to pieces. He was taking the curse of the covenant for us. And that's why Paul says in Galatians 3.14, he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. On the cross, Jesus Christ fulfilled every condition of the covenant so that God could love us unconditionally, no matter of color, language, nation, men, or woman, were equally loved and equally invited to sit at God's table forgiven and welcome as sons and, and daughters. We're welcome unconditionally in the house of our Father for eternity. And it doesn't matter how low, in which point our journey is, how long our life apparently ends, we have an eternal promise. We have a God that's always eternally faithful. So maybe you are struggling with fear or uncertainty, resentment. Let me remind you that God is next to you in, in the journey. He sits with you in the waiting. When we wait for God, we wait with God. We stand together to finish. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you that you have sealed your promises with your blood. We thank you that you are trustworthy. As Psalms 31:15 says, we believe my time, our times are in your hands. Thank you that you gave your precious life to give us eternal life. We surrender our life to you. We we ask you to bring us near. Thank you that, that, that your nearness is not depending on my capacity to hold on to you, but it is depending on, on, on your strong arm that you brought me near to, you bring me near. When I'm running far away from you, your arm reaches out and, he, and you bring me near home because you are such a loving father. We trust your timing. We confess you are good. We believe that you are always working for your glory and for the good of those who love you. Amen.